John, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Who are you? Where are you from? Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Josh. One of the most important things about me is that I'm married and I have three kids, and they kind of define my life right now. So I'm a seven-year-old, four-year-old, and two-year-old. Uh, but I'm from Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe is the, the south part of Africa, just above South Africa. Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe, grew up there, and then I was an international student myself in America for about four years, and then uh, in the UK for one year in Oxford, actually. So uh, I was, I've been a student like you guys have here, not for three years, but just for one year. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, really cool. So you mentioned that you're from Zimbabwe. What's one really good memory that you have of home? Yeah, I just think about this question. It's quite hard. How do you get a good memory of home? Um, but I think. For me, it's when I used to go home to visit. I don't know if you've been back home to your country to visit, but it's just getting back in and you open the door from the airplane and you can just feel the smell of home. You know, right? It's the weather, it's just rained outside and it just smells fresh. There's something about the rain in Zimbabwe that's different to the rain here. And here, it just seems to kind of rain. And rain. <laughs> in Zimbabwe, it rains and stops. And then the sun comes out, it's great. So yeah, I think it's that kind of smell of just, ah, oh, this is So what do you do now? So now I'm in Cambridge, and I work for a group called Cambridge International. We uh, seek to support international students, help them adjust to life in the UK, make the best of their time here, and to share the Bible with them if they'd like to know more. Thank you. So we'll let you get started in a second, Josh. Uh, just a couple, of, a couple of things to note. Um, so the story that we'll be reading today is from Luke's Gospel. You should see them on all the tables, I think. And the story is from chapter 15, verses 11 to 33. So that will be on either page 51, or depending on which Gospel you have, it could be page 42. So either page 51 or 42, uh, chapter 15, 11 to 33. Great. Well, hopefully you can work that out. Uh, we'll give you the number again just now. But, um, first of all, before we do that, we're going to look at the story in this book here. So it'd be great if you can pick it up. And as we do that, I'd love to ask you a question, just to get us thinking. What is your relationship with your family like? I mentioned I have three kids, but you know, I also come from a family where I have a mother and a father, uncles and aunts. I have five siblings, and we're a really close family. Obviously, every family has difficulties, and every relationship, every family relationship is unique. So I wonder what your relationship with your family is like. I wonder what your relationship with your friends is like. When you have a friendship, often you find it has to go two ways, doesn't it? And there has to be a sense in which both people work on the friendship. If one person is always giving, 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 and another doesn't, that's quite hard. After a while, probably one person will just sort of roll away, and this person doesn't seem interested in the friendship. And so there has to be two ways to it. It's the same for family, it's the same for friends. I have a twin sister, and uh, I'm terrible at keeping in touch with my family. They're all over the world, she's in Australia. And so sometimes I call her in the morning, it's her evening. And we went through a period where she would call regularly, and for some reason I just, just wouldn't have the time to pick up. And then she'll text, and I would text a few hours later and reply. And after a while, she said to me, Josh, what's going on? Like, we used to be so close, is there a problem? And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. It's just, I'm just bad at keeping in touch. But that's because she was giving, 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 saying, Josh, are you there? Are you there? Just, just connect, just talk, just chat. And I was not meaning to, but I was basically saying, no, not right now. And I had to go and say, I'm sorry. Um, and we love each other very much and we keep being good friends. But it needs to go both ways. And, and as we think about that, I wonder what your relationship with God is like. We're going to be reading a story here from the Bible, and we believe this is not just a story, like uh, a story that's made up. We believe it actually happened. We believe that, that God is real. And so as we're thinking about home and connection, and if we're thinking about God, how do we have a connection with God? What's our relationship like with him? The story we're going to read is actually one of the most famous stories in the world. It's one of Jesus' most famous stories, and Jesus was a master storyteller. And this story is quite incredible. 
And I think from the story we can see that there are two types of people in the world. And surprisingly, these two types of people have the same problem. So it's a story about us, but mostly it's a story about God. So if you want to read with me, I'm going to read the first bit. This story is in three sections, and I'm going to read each section as a bit of a chunk. And so um, it's actually on page 53 in these green ones. We're going to start at the top, the parable of the lost son. So Jesus is telling the story. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a, di a distant country where he squandered his wealth in wild living. After that, he spent the evening, there was, sorry, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. There's a few shocking things that happen in the story as we start off. First of all, the beginning, you see the outrageous <coughs> request from the son. You see what he says there? He says, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, the father is alive. And he's saying to him, hey, dad, I want my inheritance. <coughs> Basically say, hey dad, I wish you were dead, and since I, I can't actually kill you, just give me my inheritance now. If you said that to your parents, how would they react? That's quite shocking, isn't it? It's ridiculous. How could you say that? He's basically saying, I don't want you, dad, I want your money. Uh, he's blatant. But the next shock comes in what the father says. He says, uh, well, what he does, he says, the Bible says here, he divided his property between them. So the, the son says, Father, give me my share. And the father says, okay. That's shocking, isn't it? He would probably would expect him to say, no, what are, you, what are you saying? Wait, wait, wait till the end. That's so rude. No, of course not. So he divides it between them. And then things just get worse. The son takes a share of the property, which probably wouldn't have been money. In, in these days, it would have been maybe the fields and the land and, and all the property on the farm, stuff to make a living. And he got it together and he sold it outside of the family. Now, many of you may come from backgrounds where, where you understand how important this is. But if not, imagine an agricultural society where everything that happens needs to happen on your farm. If you want to get food, you've got to grow it. If you want to trade with someone, well, you've got to have something to trade. What he's done is he's taken the family property, he sold it, put the money in his pocket, and he's gone off to another country. And then when he gets there, he wastes the money, doesn't save it, spends it all, and he ends up in a field feeding pigs. Now to the people Jesus is talking to, this is the worst possible thing. Pigs are unclean animals. And so these pigs that he's feeding it gets so bad, he's starving to death. He thinks, I wish I could just eat the pods that the pigs eat. If this were a, a play, the curtain would close. And that's the end of part one. And as you do that, I just want to pause and think, this is a picture of someone who is far away from God. Jesus is saying this is what it looks like when someone rejects God, and ignores him in their life. They, they're looking for happiness and contentment somewhere else. I'm going to be my own master. And off they go. They, the son pushes boundaries, doesn't he? He ignores the father. He wants what the father has. He wants the father's stuff. He doesn't want the father. He takes the father's stuff and he leaves. How does he treat the father? Well, it's pretty terrible. And the problem is he wants the father's things, not the father. Now imagine... As a student yourself, you've left home, maybe your parents have sacrificed lots of things for you. And imagine a student who has had their parents sacrifice a lot, and off they go. And after their education, the student decides, I'm not going home, I'm not going to my parents, I'm going to live my own life, and just cuts the parents out of their life completely. We're getting close to something about what's happening here. The 
The son is saying, I don't want you. I just want to benefit from what you can give me. Like the younger son, maybe we're far away from God, and maybe we, we take what God gives us, creation, the world around us, everything we have as Christians, we believe everything in the world is given to us as a gift by God. The air we breathe, day by day, is God's air. So maybe we just ignore him, or we say, well, okay, yeah, I do want God in my life, as long as he helps me with my exams. As long as I can get good grades, as long as he helps my life become a kind of good thing. Now, if God does give us good things, he's not stingy. He doesn't sort of hold things away and say, no, only if you're a good person. He gives us lots of good things. The problem is, sometimes we can just ignore God and just say, no, I'm not going to acknowledge you. I'm going to just do what I want. What's the solution? Well, let's go back to the story and look at the next part. So you'll see again from verse 17, we pick the story up again. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. The son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. It's amazing that the son comes to his senses. I love that phrase. He's sort of sitting there feeding the pigs and he, he just sort of realizes reality. He sees the messy the man thinks, hang on, I've got this all wrong. What's really the case is that my father has a much better place back there. He longs to go home. His father's house, house he realizes, is not such a bad place. Actually, it's quite a good place. So he makes a plan. You see that in verse 18 to verse 19, he says, I'm going to go back. I'm going to say to my father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Please make me a servant. And so you can imagine him kind of rehearsing this in his head as he walks back. He says, my father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. If you've ever had to forgive someone or, or ask for forgiveness, you know that this moment is, is tricky. So he's rehearsing it. He's probably going over in his head what he'll do. But do you see, the problem is he's still not thinking about his father in terms of a relationship. It's still something he wants to get from the father. Father, I'm not, I'm not your son. Let me be like a servant, and I'll, I'll earn my place in this house again. I, I wouldn't be a servant so I can get some food. You know, put me in a servant's hall, that's fine, but, but please, hire me as a servant. He's not thinking about the father as a father. He's thinking about him as a boss. So as he walks home, I wonder, maybe he's thinking, oh, what's going to happen? Is he, how's he, what's he going to react like? What will he do? What do you expect the father to do? Maybe, maybe he's just sort of standing there, well, this better be good. You better have a good explanation for this. Or maybe he opens the door and sees the sun and it's just slammed right in the face. Or maybe it's, okay, okay, you want to come in? Okay. By the way, here's the debt that you've racked up by selling the family. You'll be working this off over the next 20 years. You can come in, but you better be ready to work hard. <coughs> well, <laughs> what does the father do? Look what he does in verse 21. He runs, he embraces the son, he kisses him. And the son thinks, okay, great, now's my moment. He seems to be kind of ready to forgive me. Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. He's talking to the father. But you see, he doesn't finish what he's planned. He's supposed to get to the part where he says, make me a servant. I'm not your son, make me a servant. And the father cuts him off. Instead, he turns to his servant and he says, bring a robe, put it on him, put a ring on him, put sandals on his feet. Let's celebrate, kill the fattened calf. It's like saying, spend lots of money on this feast. We're going to celebrate. All of these things are symbols that this son is a son, not a servant. 
He's saying, my son is back. Let's celebrate him again. Let's have him crazy. This is an amazing picture of God's love for us. It's an amazing picture of who God is really like. Sometimes you might think God is like a strict teacher or a policeman or someone who just wants us to obey the rules and if we come to him, he's going to be checking on what we've done, like maybe like Santa Claus, to make sure we've had a good year, we've done all the right things. This tells us no. God is waiting for us to come home. He's waiting for us to come home and, and say, This is my child. She was lost, but now she's found. This is a picture of being accepted by God. So the solution to being far away from God is first of all, recognize where we are, far away from God, and then come home. And so as we think about this story, it's meant to make us think about ourselves and to ask, are we like the younger son? Maybe we want God for the things that he can give us. He's a bit like a bank or an insurance company. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd like to have safety and security there. I'd like blessings. I'd, let, I'd like to get good stuff from God. But there's, there's no relationship. to a home, not a bank. Or maybe actually your life is quite good and you think, oh wow, well, I'm doing quite well, studies are going well, family's great, I've got a good prospect ahead of me. But maybe there's a sense of, is this all there is? And God is wanting us to say, actually, the Father's house is a good place to be. Come home to a house. God is waiting, he doesn't force us to come. Or maybe, maybe you do see yourself here. Maybe you know you're like this rebellious son who has completely rejected God and you're far away. You're kind of stuck like you were stuck with the pigs. Maybe you're stuck doing things you know are wrong. Maybe you're stuck and you think, how do I get out of this mess? Maybe there's a sense that does God really want me back after all I've done? Maybe does God really want me at all? In a sense, we need to do what the sun did, and come back to ourselves, to come back to our senses and remember God's place, God's home is the best place to be. The good news of the story is that God loves us so much, he's waiting for us. He's looking for us, ready to come back, not to say, okay, you're back now, time to start working. Or, oh, you're back, huh, Tommy, what did you do with all that money? He's saying, come home, come home, you're part of this family. Maybe you think this is unfair. Maybe you think, goodness me, how did he let that worthless son back in? Wow, the story's not over. So, let's keep reading. See, because we said that this was a story about two types of people, and the father had two sons. So, we'll keep reading from verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has not back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father came out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look! All these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders, but you never gave me even a young goat to celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, but he's found. The two sons, the younger, far away, and the older, and this older son is very, very different from the younger son. He's not far away dishonoring the family. In fact, he's in the field working hard. He doesn't even see the younger son come back because he's working all day to help the family. <coughs> This is a good, upright son. He's kept the rules. 
and he hears the noise of singing and dancing, and he calls a servant. I wonder if maybe he's thinking, is this a party for me? Uh, a party always wanted. And his explanation from the servant makes the brother furious. He refuses to come in. And in fact, you see, just like the younger son, where the father comes out, the father comes out to the older brother as well. And, and he comes out looking for his son, and he pleads with him, come in. Look at the, the son's response. He says to him here, look, all these years I've been saving you. He's really disrespectful to the father. He doesn't say my father. He says, look, you never talk to your elder like that. And you see, he's also viewing the relationship, not like a relationship. But this person is my boss. For all these years, I've been slaving for you. He says, look, I'm, I'm like one of your servants. You might call me your son, but I'm, I'm just slaving away for you. I'm working hard for you, and yet you don't pay me. You don't give me even a young goat to go and celebrate with my friends. Notice he's much more concerned about what he gets from the father than about the relationship with the father. He wants payment for his work. He wants recognition. Look at all He won't even acknowledge his brother. He says, this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours. Can you see the kind of bitterness and anger and anger he has? What's the problem with this son's relationship and the father? I think it's the same. He treats the father terribly. And he wants what the father has, but not the father himself. I remember I said that the story is about two different types of people. Both brothers, I think, have the same problem. They don't want a relationship with their father, and they don't have one either. On the one hand, you have the rebellious son, the outcast. Everyone knows this, that's the naughty one. He doesn't have a relationship with his father. But the other one is also far away from the father. Even though he looks close, he's far away. He doesn't have a relationship of a father and a son. It's a relationship of a manager <coughs> and a worker, of a boss and someone who works for the boss. It's a relationship of a servant, not a slave. He wants to make the, f the father proud, not because of love, but because he wants to be rewarded for what he does. And again, we're asked to think, who are we like? Are we like this older brother? May we say to God something like, look, I, I work hard to do well. I try to be a good person. I, I'm, I'm honest. I try to be honest. I respect other people. I try to be as humble and as kind as possible. God, what have you ever given me? God, why are these bad things happening? God, can't you just bless me in this area? I've worked so hard and you haven't given me anything. We look at the story. We expect the father to say, How dare you speak to me like that? But actually, he is again a loving, loving father. So look at that verse 31, the final bit. My son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we have to celebrate and be glad. This brother of yours, who was dead, is alive again. He was lost and was found. And then the curtain closes. Cool. We don't know if the older brother goes in. We know the younger brother went in, but we don't know. The invite is there for the older brother. Come in! And we don't know what happens. So, we do have to ask ourselves, are we like the older brother? I was. This is me, the older brother. And sometimes it's still me. I like people to think I'm doing the right thing. I like to do the right thing so I can be recognized. I like to think that if I do good things, God will recognize me. And although I knew of God, and although I knew he was there, I believed he was there, it was a relationship of, I'll do the right thing, and then God will be happy with me. In reality, though, I was doing my own thing. I worked hard, like the older brother, but I wanted to earn my place in God's family. 
It was just a relationship where I thought if I do something, surely God will give me something. In a place like Oxford, I'm sure there are many people like that. Very driven people. People who want to do well. And that could be a good thing, but if it spills over into our relationship with God, where we think, ah, if I do well, God should give me something. We have a problem. Because it's not a relationship. It's a deal. It's a manager and a worker. It's a boss and a slave. There's no relationship there. The elder brother thinks, if I, if I do this or I do that, then I'll get recognition, then I'll get love. Then I'll finally be accepted. He wants God, whoever God is, to bless him. Perhaps you come from a background where, where that is what religion is like, where we do things to get blessings. We want those blessings in our lives. But, but maybe there's no real relationship. I love Nihal's testimony where he says, get this concept of God, but no real understanding of what that meant to be in a relationship where he could have peace and security every day, knowing he could trust God day by day. Jesus says, come into a relationship that's not based on transaction. It's not based on you do something and I'll give you something. Come in to the feast. I love you. Although one father is far away and disowns God, so one son is far away and disowns God, the other son is near to the father and appears respectful, appears respectable, but neither of them had their heart in the right place. God is loving and gentle, just like the father, and he never shouts at us to say, How dare you? He says to us, Come. It might be hard, actually, for the older brother come back because he looks so close. It's hard to recognize there's something wrong there. Imagine that both those sons did come in, that the curtain opens and the final scene is the older brother coming in and there's a huge celebration. And I imagine the father going around to all the guests saying, hey, this is my younger son. You know, he stole our money. He went away. He spent it on prostitutes. He's a bit of a waster. This is my son. And hey, guess what? This is my son too. He's been here the whole time. He thinks he can earn love. <laughs> he works really hard. This is my son. They're both my sons. Not because of anything they've done, but because they're my son. And that's what God is like. That's what the Christian God is like. Jesus teaches us this story to tell us who we are, to help us recognize who we are, but also to say, this is who God is. This is who God is. Someone who is warm and loving and says, come into my family, come into my home. You can never be good enough. You can never be bad enough to not come in. Just come in. So the question I want to leave with you is, which, which son are you? Which one do you most identify with?